Okay, it's time for round two of the Bevel Bonanza. Let's see if we can wrap this one up. Time magic. I say once you start using it, it's really hard to to stop. It's really like an amazingly handy tool. I understand why I like these uh, Twitch streamers and stuff uh, stream like non-stop and don't want to take breaks because as soon as you take breaks like all the viewers disappear you're like no, no one likes me Damn it, I wish I had made one of those. <sighs> I wanted to have uh, some little coils or something, but they are annoying to build. Okay, project, let's do one. I said their opinion yes to make me mean, they take at least like a minute. There Fine. That's how that's the incorrect and lazy way of making a coil. I mean okay it's not incorrect but it's definitely lazy. And that's how I roll by not rolling.
Yeah, the thing is like... It doesn't make sense, I should just make hydraulics. But coils are so cool! I can't help it. It's like... It's the best. Real Housewives of 3D. I mean, to be fair, my wife is away working and I am sitting here taking care of the cat and doing mix, you know. So, it's pretty much. Gonna be some proper hydraulics as well, I promise, not just fake shit. Oh my god, I touched the interface. I have seen. So I. I made a mech uh, like this using almost only the rounded shader some time ago. The precedent only a time ago, since time flies so fast, like two years ago. And it was really cool because it was extremely fun to build. Because since I was using uh, pretty much only the um, rounded shader and booleans, it was extremely satisfying to just sit and experiment and cut. And it was amazingly fun, but it also has lots of downsides. Um, and uh, I actually thought of doing uh, like a low poly version of that one, um, but due to the fact that I built it all with the rounded shader, uh, that makes it a little bit annoying to optimize because I did not intend to build it uh, with low poly in the beginning, so I actually had lots of really annoying cutouts and stuff, so so I didn't. And that's why it's uh, so convenient, like this workflow is a lot more convenient for making something actually uh, to a low poly. Because I can... Uh First of all, one cool thing is like all these polystyne things, are tagged so if you do lots of details with the polystyne you can literally batch remove them later for example if you add lots of insets and stuff and you can just start going through and uh, removing them as a batch and that's pretty fucking awesome uh, and the same thing with like I tag all my uh, presets that I add uh, I should probably tag even more things it's actually like there's a lot of cool stuff you can do if you just stop and uh, think about what you're gonna do next in your pipeline. For example, um, I had this idea that I haven't bothered to implement, but for example, nowadays I almost never use support edges, right, when you do sub -E. But there's no reason why you shouldn't just tag all the support edges automatically, tag them with a polygon tag, and then you can just remove them. So when you go like, oh, I'm gonna make this into a low poly, done. Um, now I use weights instead, so it's already in stuff. But if you're rocking those old school subdies, you can just remove all the support loops in one click. Just the same. Uh, 
<sighs> hmm. Question is, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's do it. Sounded weird. Okay, so I'm definitely gonna have to do something special with this piece to make. I mean, okay, this doesn't make sense at all. Uh, should I merge? How it's supposed to work. There it is. There's the thing. It's not actually floating in the air. Yeah, these are live booleans. These are my cutters.
some nonsensical detailing. This is not gonna make any sense. Mechanically speaking. Uh, you can do the model 10 as well. Yeah, uh, I can't script uh, for shit, so whenever you see me doing something, it's probably not very hard to set up. Um, all my uh, procedural booleans are set up with um, presets, basically. It's a bit. There are a few things that are frustrating because there are a few things that you can't access with presets. Like it doesn't respect everything, so which is a bit annoying. So I hope they add that support. But you can automate a lot of the stuff that you would normally uh, do. So that's cool. Yeah, so I've been saying that I'm gonna make a new Gumroad tutorial for some time. I just need to, you know, actually do it. Um, so yeah, the plan is actually to make a tutorial after I finished these uh, robots. And make a, I want to make a sub D a tutorial for model, which you know none of that input is really new, but it's just like a collection of stuff and tricks and tips on how to work with the uh, sub D model. Just because there are some you know, random things that could be useful, I guess. Yeah, I mean, basically, I'm not gonna make it. I will probably, you know, drop some new info in a new tutorial, but uh, but to be fair, a lot of what I would say in my tutorials, I say here. It's just that uh, it'll be a bit more condensed. Probably shut the balcony door. Well, I don't know, people ask me that, um, no, the, tr uh, the transparent uh, uh, the transparent pools is, 
basically just a material in the shader tree that tells everything that is in my cutter groups to be uh, um, uh, to be transparent. So and uh, why I work without the uh, um, uh, wireframe is because a lot of the time I don't need it um, because my to be fair my models are relatively simplistic when it comes to the uh, wireframe like my sub D meshes are not super complex and I don't rely so much on the wireframe and the shading that I uh, uh, need it so much so uh, I just you know I just don't need it uh, so I um, work without it because it allows me to see the shapes better Uh, yeah, I made this from scratch today. Hardest design challenge ever. That's tricky to say. I don't think there's a specific one because it's not like. Because I have tons of designs that I've made that were uh, definitely like a huge challenge uh, that I also miserably failed at. So I don't know. Do, do those count? Because like everything I did, basically I've been designing things since I started with 3D. I, I, I have never relied on other people's concepts, only in production when I had to use other people's concepts. Otherwise, I've always been designing my own things. Um, so basically, everything has been a challenge because my designs have sucked um, for years and years and years. Uh, and I guess gradually less sucked. But the problem is also that um, the games industry is not uh, stagnant. So what was considered good design some years ago is no longer considered good design because there are so many more people in the industry now that actually do design and do good design that the goalposts are constantly moving so it's super hard to make like to, you know you have to even if you're good at design if you're not evolving what you're making now might not be considered good anymore in a few years, not just because tastes change, but also because, to be fair, like it's a young and small industry. Coils are the best. Right, now I'm doing it again. I'm doing things on the underside of the foot. Dead, dead.
you can see with the leg. Oh, by the way, I made uh, made some renders. I think the only ones who don't struggle are the ones that are uh, uh, that don't push themselves very hard. Like if you're happy with uh, your work and go like, yeah, that's it, I'm I'm done. I'm uh, I don't need to get any better than this. Then uh, that's the explanation to why they are uh, they don't feel the struggle. So everyone. Everyone struggles, and if you're growing as an artist, you'll definitely feel it because you're not happy with your work, and you most likely <laughs> never will be. That's for the territory. This is something I do quite a lot. I just uh, use the transform tool and just uh, tweak my cables like this, but then they get all messed up. And then I use uh, Seneca's uh, pipe rebuilder tool to rebuild it into a perfect um, tube again. It's really, it's really sweet. Yesterday's model is already finished. Yeah, wait, I'm gonna. All the recordings are up on the YouTube. Uh, Render Sawyer here. I mean, it's finished, finished, but it's not, you know, production model finished, but, you know, whatever. Mostly because uh, I'm live streaming and uh, if I was doing this like properly I wanted to make sure that it moved correctly then I would probably spend more time on the mock-up and uh, do basic motion tests at least um, but now uh, I'm just wondering if we I don't think I mean its range of motion is probably not very good and so on. But yeah. Uh, eh. In case you can't see it, they're saying yes.
Yeah, the robot from yesterday is uh, levitating. That's why it has those. Uh, the discs on the bottom are uh, discs for levitation. And. Uh, And then it has engines on the back. Is that the Modo Funk user, or is that just another Funk monster? Because if it's Funk, then you know, because it's the same way. Yeah, it's the same way as before, just. Um, Merging, uh, I have a depend. I actually made like a bunch of presets that I can spawn, like assembly presets with different setups. But yeah, merge them to another layer um, and then do a boolean from there. And then I just uh, uh, tag and uh, tag all the groups that have the cutters in them. So that I can uh, easily hide, toggle them on off. That's also one of the reasons why I'm using the advanced viewport, so that the transparency works well. I mean, cars are some of the most complex things you can model, to be honest. When it comes to just purest sub D nightmares, because. I mean, that's what they are. Um, it's not easy to make car models because they have so many curves and shapes. It's like, it's crazy. So it's not exactly the easiest thing to start with. I mean, I would have to fiddle around a lot if I would make a car, like, properly. Um, yeah, you have, <laughs> you have 10 modifiers in mode as well. Oh, my cat is an idiot. <sighs> I have to go let in my cat from the balcony, even though, because he don't want, he only wants to use this door, not the other door that is actually open.
out. No tutorials that I know of. It's all relatively new and it's one of those things where the way I'm using them is maybe not you know how many others are using them, so
Hmm. This is one big piece I have to figure out. Good old random extrusion. What is this even? All oh, right, didn't I do a thingy? Yeah, I did. Even what am I even doing? Does this even make sense? Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, whatever. It makes sense. No. Pretend that it makes sense. You've been missing out. So this one here is like one on sexy angle. I can feel the block outness in it. wave <laughs> yeah I uh, used actually the first proper 3d program I learned was uh, light wave uh, and that was uh, before uh, Modo came out but then the light wave team pretty much made Modo they left and made Modo pretty much um, and then I tried Modo and uh, that's it. No more lightweight. I actually used lightweight a bit after that just for the rendering because lightweight had so good texture filtering. Um, and I couldn't figure out how to do that in Modo back then. Uh, 
back when I thought that something is sharp, it's a good thing. Okay, so this is like a bit more than five hours in. I got less than three hours to wrap this up. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> Stupid cat. <laughs> I mean, I haven't, to be honest, like, I haven't used the Lightweight since, like, well, before they rebooted it. That was like, I don't know, it's like Lightweight 8? I don't think I ever even used Lightweight 8. I think I was on 6.5 or something, I don't know. It was back in, like, the Dark Ages. So if I if I do something very random, it's because the cat is doing it. What are you doing? Okay. Meow. Yeah. You're too fat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ZBrush is, is, you know, great. Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff in ZBrush is horrible. If you're not used to ZBrush, it's very special. It's not, uh, it's not a competitor to uh, Maya and Lightwave, though. In the same way. I mean, Simbrush doesn't do anything other than sculpting. As far as I know. Or, like, it doesn't do anything well. Except sculpting. Yeah, especially since they have uh, things like GoZ, so you just want to uh, use that instead to go between programs. I mean, if you had the choice, like you wouldn't use the polymodeling modeling tools. I mean, that's for extra tiny stuff, quick stuff. It's not for like full-on modeling. I mean, you can use it for that, but you know, it's not the most effective way. The same way that you, you have sculpting tools in Modo, and they are great for touch-ups, but I wouldn't advise you to try to use it to replace uh, ZBrush in your 
sculpting pipeline. Because then you're just in for a world of hurt. Yeah, my uh, well, it's not a macro; it's a preset. Um, but yeah, it uh, creates everything for me. It actually creates like I have several different setups, so uh, it depends on what I want to do. But yeah, it does uh, create a whole bunch of things, so I don't have to do anything except to start modeling. Um, no setup needed. Because that was the thing that annoys me the most as well, like, why can't I just start modeling instantly, but I have to do a setup. So uh, I removed the setup. It's actually not that hard. But yeah, that's definitely a subject I should probably expand to a full tutorial at some point. Yeah, if it feels silly, because I don't feel like I'm that home with tools yet myself.
No, it's uh, it's an assembly. Because uh, assemblies, the only way to do uh, uh, mesh shop presets is with assemblies. So you just set them up, and then you make sure all the nodes are uh, represented in the uh, uh, assembly uh, in the uh, setup tab, and then you just. Uh, Export it as an assembly. It has, you know, there it has rules for what follows in an export. It ha all has to be inside the workspace container and you know stuff like that. But if you do that, you can do it. You can't do any complex operations because it doesn't save the uh, order of the uh, um, mesh ops. So you can't have certain things. You can't do. Not without unnecessarily uh, obfuscating it and just, yeah, you can, for example, get around all that by using extra many merge nodes between different layers so that there is no order really. There's a difference between an assembly preset and uh, a normal preset. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely possible. It's not very hard. It's, uh, you just need to... Uh, um, well, yeah, basically what I said. It's... Uh, some things you can't do, but then you can just create an assembly preset and you can drag drop it into the scene. And then you just... Uh, so basically I just have empty layers set up in my assembly. And then I just uh, drag that assembly basically into the scene. Or in my case with these specific one, some specific ones, I just have a hotkey for spawning them. And then it spawns this uh, assembly. So basically every, every time I spawn these uh, folders, which is like this boolean sub this simple, and then it spawns these groups and this uh, you know, final mesh. And it also spawns like these cutter layers and the merge layers and then this one. And then I um, can work in these two different layers, for example. And also, you know, <coughs> if you want materials to spawn with them, you have to make sure the materials are there in the assembly. So, it's a bit of a hassle to set it up first time before you, you know, figure out how it works. It took me some time to make it, you know, basically export properly. So I was like, I didn't understand why it didn't. Yeah, that's the default render. It's a default render without any light sources. It's only one of the. This is this render is uh, this is default moto with one of the HDRIs that ship with moto. And no light sources. Like this is literally, I didn't even click a button. This is just press render. Yeah, exactly. I start I spawn them, and then basically I have a pre setup. So the trick with the mesh ops is that it gets very sluggish if you have too much in one setup. So I have like one setup for this big piece here, and I have one for this part of the leg. And then I made another one for this part of the leg. And then those basically function as, you know, just normal items that I can work in.
my computer specs is uh, 64 gigs RAM, uh, i7 6700K processor, and uh, and a 1080 GTX. That doesn't matter so much here because it's not like I'm straining the graphics card. Well, the CPU is important, especially when, when rendering, if you have a CPU renderer. But to be honest, like I never, uh, like my models don't strain the computer that much. They're pretty lightweight most of the time, in terms of polygons. I mean, this one is only 8.2 million, because I'm using the rounded shader so much. Um, I have been working on this one for five and a half hours or so.
Good question. I don't know actually, I don't... I don't have any single person that inspires me the most. Um, it's more, you know, there are lots of people that quite often make things that inspire me, but there's no one that, you know, stands out the most. Let's say. There's tons of people that inspired me instead. Signal, signal. last game I played. I actually, I am uh, playing through uh, Trine 2 with my wife at the moment. And before that it was Trine and before that I played uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Which was a game that I thought that I would hate because I didn't think it looked interesting. I didn't like, I don't know, I didn't think I would like it at all and then it was amazing. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I actually um, actually wanted to try that. It's uh, on my list. Uh, I'm gonna play uh, Ryan, I think, after um, after I finished trying to. Yeah, I went straight to uh, 3D. I can't, I can't draw. It looks horrible. I have been like trying to learn to draw, like on and off since forever so when I was actually studying I actually tried you know I took lots of drawing courses and I became slightly less shit at drawing but you know I I don't know proper perspective I can't I can't do anything right when it comes to drawing so my other drawings are like you know tiny little ink drawings um, I do like sketches so that you know sketches of designs but they're you know they're only for me if I would give them to someone else's concept art they would be like why, why would this look good
Yeah, I mainly just use it to, you know, try things out. Uh, see how it works. I always, I always make, you know, these photographic drawings, basically. <sighs> hmm. That was yesterday's robot, by the way, if you didn't see that stream. Just gonna borrow some hydraulics. Oh yeah, yeah I've seen his sketchbooks, I mean they're amazing, that's you know, what I wish I could do. That's another problem, it's like, that's another problem that I have, it's that you know, once you're decently good at something, it uh, sucks to, I don't know, I don't like to feel like I suck at something. So now that I'm actually, you know, pretty decent at 3D, it's like it hurts extra much to uh, go back to 2D and be like, should I make a nice 3D model or a shit drawing? Which you know is totally the wrong way to look at it, but you know, can't help it. I can't help myself thinking about it that way. Thanks! It was a really fun game to work on. The team did like a kick ass job on that.
<laughs> um, there will be no retop. Oh no, won't have time for that. Um, yeah, tablet won't help me at all because I have so many hotkeys. I actually have a twenty button mouse, uh, so I can fit more hotkeys. So using a tablet for me would be uh, way way slower. It just wouldn't work for me. I know some people model with a tablet. I personally think they are crazy, but then again, I never, you know, gave it a serious shot. So maybe it's awesome, but I don't see how I could. I would have to change my approach quite drastically, I think, for that. More coils. Coils. I should just have this music on the whole time. It's the best. It's the best part of this playlist. Yeah, I'm a bit afraid what's gonna happen when my mouse gives up, because we can't buy it anymore, I think. I don't think it's in stock anywhere anymore. Should have bought like 10 of them and just been like stocking up for the apocalypse. Actually, now that we're happily coiling away. action up here. I actually wanted to make one earlier but I was uh, pushing out because I didn't want to so this is the kind of coil that uh, doesn't make any sense. Oh I forgot to copy a piece Mode actually has a ton of retopper tools. So it depends on what kind of retopper you're doing. For some kinds it's extremely good. <laughs> well, you have to put that hot case on them. Silly man. Step on the keyboard. Okay. I'm gonna cap in my face right there.
<sighs> well, the shader stack is nothing. Yeah, most of the work will be mirrored. Um, yeah, the material setup is nothing. It's literally... This has a green color. And there's also a... Where is it in hide? Yeah, there's like one occlusion node. That's it. That's the only node. There's nothing else. The rest is just like... Some values. So one of the things that frustrates me with uh, is the uh, how I mirror things because I use the I use an instance, I just instance and hierarchy. Uh, so once I you know finish with something, I just instance that whole hierarchy over to the other side. Problem with that is that um, while you are working and creating new layers, those won't be uh, instanced over. So I wish I could just like instance a group, like all the everything in a group and keep that grouping basically uh, no the other piece is not rendering now because I've been too lazy to set it up I do have a lot of things that I should be rendering but uh, some other time I have enough to do as it is But yeah, once I do the proper renders of this tonight, I will just do it with a network rendering. So I can do stuff. So I can work where the computer works. So I basically put, instead of uh, using my other computer to help render, I just put everything on the other older slow computer. So my renders actually take twice as long, it's just that I can do other stuff while I uh, wait for them. No, he's uh, sleeping. No, he's dead. Yeah, my cat doesn't, he used to be like that, and lie in front of the keyboard like that, but he doesn't fit anymore. And he barely fits behind the screens either. He's pretty big. sure what to do now. Yeah, um, I'm not very good with uh, presenting my work. I always just make really sloppy stuff uh, because I can't be bothered to set it up and wait. Because that's not why I'm doing it anyway, like to make nice renders. It's probably like pretty stupid of me because you know I should be presenting my work better, but. Uh, takes time and I don't feel like it.
Yeah, I almost never use concepts. <laughs> um well yeah it is faster in many ways uh, it's uh, mesh fusion is great for doing what you can do with mesh fusion like you can uh, do things like uh, um Whenever you have like these large intersections that actually needs to be there with the real geometry, sure that's great. But if you not have those, then mesh fusion doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't do much. So what I do is that I use uh, the me uh, normal mesh ops because it allows me to um, uh, just do normal modeling. Instead of thinking of how things work uh, like mesh fusion, I just uh, I can just keep on modeling and then just do normal booleans and everything, and everything fits into my normal workflow. And I can use edge weighting properly. You know, the list goes on. Yeah, they do work great. Um, I mean, they work great in general. Uh, I won't use like I won't use them for the full modeling. Um, because you know, that's when things break. You try to use them for uh, replace all the normal modeling, but for doing things like this, it's uh, great. This is a weird thing that happens sometimes. You have to use the constraint at an angle, so otherwise it just goes through. I don't know why that is, you see? Uh, why? Why did you do this? All those weird quirks. <sighs> okay, there.
Um, I use the constraint to background. Okay, hmm, what time is it? Okay, uh, how much is that? Alright, still got two more hours. is a beta feature and I can't talk about it help myself I need some rivets yeah it's like a big censorship filter like yeah that's not that's not suspicious actually one big thing that I missed doing before these um, streams was to create a small uh, library of decals because I would like to put some decals on. I was actually gonna do like a toolkit for uh, decals, but uh, lol, time. I'll do that later. I really like this uh, decal machine thing for Blender. That was awesome. So. Uh, Figured I would uh, do a few of the things, the more easy things to do in that one that I don't even need scripting for. Cool thing is that you can actually make a lot of tools yourself in Modo uh, using the pipeline tool. So you can actually do things like create your own tools uh, without any scripting or anything. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like uh, really cool um, because with the, just a few settings you can change, you know, how tools work. Placing rivets is so nice, just so chill. You don't need to think. Click some buttons. Yeah, I mean, 
to be honest, like even though it seems like I know Modo like a lot, there's still tons of things I haven't even touched, and uh, there are tons of things I could learn. It's just you know, it's just too much stuff. For, like one person to just learn like that. For example, painting out rivets is one of those things where I uh, often uh, make like an extra layer just because I want it to be super quick. I don't want any delay when I place them. Even this is like a bit slow. So often I just split them into several layers then I just merge them, merge them just because it's faster. So now it's like 0.1 second delay. And it's Good enough, I need that instant feeling. Well, I really, yeah, you know, I really can't do that either because. You have features that rule each other out, like you can't use this part of the pipeline because you're using another, because they're like opposites, you know, you can't use fully dynamic light and the bait light at the same time, it doesn't make sense. What is this little sloppiness? The same thing in Modo, like, I mean, I'm not gonna look into the physics stuff, and I haven't, I never used the particles either. I mean, I don't even know where to find them. There's stuff in there somewhere. <laughs> well, the biggest influence by far is uh, real world machinery, because that's where I take the vast majority of my inspiration from. Then of course I take tons of inspiration from books, movies, like everyone else. But a lot of my shape language details and things that I like come from uh, construction machines, for example. A heavy, worn uh, uh, look. When I was in Italy, I saw like this awesome uh, cleaning truck and started taking pictures of it. And the guys came out and started like shouting at me. So I was taking pictures of them. But they were just joking, but I didn't understand that because I don't speak Italian. Hello.
The thing is that when you're working, it's like it feels like you're working so fast because you're working as I mean I mean I'm working as well I'm not working as fast as I can right now chilling, but um, in general you work you know and you feel like you are really working hard. But then when you watch a recording of yourself, it's like. Like, what am I doing? Why is this just like, why is it so slow? That's why I uh, like to do the rivets by hand. It's only when I make large straight lines because. I want that subtle, uh, you know, that they're not exactly straight. And it's also one of the things that I always do that I always place rivets like a little bit random, like my lines. Because people like to place rivets in, you know, corners of plates and where people would attach things, like, like, sure, like, like the corners like this, that makes sense. But when you look at things like aircraft and so on, a lot of the rivets are just like, placed in totally arbitrary places for for the viewer like they're placed like this for example and that, that it does make sense until you see the inside because maybe they are bolted onto a structural component that is on the inside so a lot of the time i use rivets to um, like not where you would expect them to be just because i want to uh, hint at that, you know, feeling, what do you call it? Uh, I, um, I don't know if I should call myself self-taught. I'm more or less self-taught. I went to school where uh, I didn't learn anything because we didn't even have a 3D teacher, uh, like proper 3D teacher, and uh, so I didn't learn anything about modeling in school or or 3D at all, actually. Um, so I learned most of it at home and from friends and from you know internet. So I don't think it's fair to call it self-taught when you are uh, actually because. If we didn't have internet, sure, I guess it would count as self-taught, but I was taught by the internet. And by people that I've worked with through the years. It's not like I learned 3D, then got a job. I've been, you know, learning 3D every day. That looks wrong, I'm gonna ignore it. Um... There's several ways to bake them normal. You can either uh, create a texture, you s just have a normal texture, you apply it to your low poly, you set it to normal, um, and then you just right click on it and you take bake from object to texture. That's one way. You can also uh, create a render output that is uh, shading normal. And make sure you have remap pixel values checked in the box, and then you Bake up an object space normal map. That's another way to do it. That's one I use all the time. Because I am. Uh, oops. No, wait, that was the right one. Ha! Ah! What the fuck? Um, because I use object space normal maps all the time. Because I just like that workflow. Uh, I have been going for like six hours. Uh, some of the booleans are live, some are not. Most of them were are live. So, when I wait the whole object, it's uh, exactly how you would do it if you would do it manually. I basically select under mouse, select the entire thing, convert uh, polygon selection to edges, and set the edge weight and drop selection. So, basically I just do that, but with a macro.
actually, uh, when I was learning 3D, I started out with Lightwave, or, you know, actually started out with Bryce, but that wasn't real 3D. Uh, I started out with Lightwave, but, you know, they used Maya in school, so uh, I started learning Maya, and we have courses in Maya. Around the same time Moto came out, so I was learning Maya, and I also... So I was using Maya and Lightwave, and then Moto came out, and then I switched to Moto from Lightwave like instantly because it was so much better. Uh, at least for modeling. And uh, and then I had to use Maya now and then. I mean, you can't work in this industry and like never open Maya again because you know there's always. Animators use my, and you know it's common. So uh, I also have to use 3D Studio Max for a bit, which was uh, not so fun. So I don't like it. So the thing with rivets and too busy is that you can add shit loads of rivets as long as you don't add any uh, like contrast to them you know basically um, as long as you that's why I often make things that are quite uniform in color like few colors because if you have something that is uniform in color and you have contrast in the color somewhere else the uh, uniform uh, places will uh, read as less busy so I never do things like highlight my details with other colors and stuff because I rather keep it simple with uh, very few colors because then I can actually um, add more detail I'm basically using less color so I can have more details and get away with it That's one feature that I wish Modo had, the ability to render and keep working. So, because now you can do that, if you launch a separate Modo client, do a render in that one and you just keep working in the one you were in before, but that's, uh, you know, more complicated than it needs to be. Here we have special rivets.
Uh, the way I do the rivets is a script by Seneca called rotate to or unrotate. Um, so it basically grabs the uh, polygon selection, uses the uh, edge selection as a base, and then can duplicate it out. Yeah. Like that. And then I made a macro that grabs the uh, floater under the mouse so I can quickly select floaters. Um, but there's also the tag tool in Modo that does more or less the same thing. Um, I can't really spend a week on this, uh, to be honest. I would get bored. Especially, I mean, I could spend a week on it if I was just working like normal, very chill pace. Um, but, you know, at this rate, I could probably spend two, three days on it and then it will be like really, really detailed. Like, these models that I'm making now um, are some of the most uh, detailed models I've made in a long, long time. Uh, because it's different when you do a live stream model versus like uh, when I'm doing something in production for a company because then you have to think about what you're doing now I can just do whatever I want there's not, no right or wrong so it's very very different Um, not mesh paint, uh, Seneca script. Um, well, yeah, I am faster than average, no matter how you see it. But it's very different to do something for someone else, because you then you have to factor into, yeah, like lots of other things. Oh no. Oh, okay, I'm just gonna crash or something.
Uh, uh, no, I don't follow. I'm not quite sure which thing you asked about. something bad. I didn't. Beta is running uh, great, actually. It's, uh, except for the one bug. It's uh, very stable. There's one feature I wish as well, like one of the things I uh, wish was in the, um, that you could put in the assemblies is that you can uh, color code your uh, mesh items, which is pretty cool. You can like uh, color code it like uh, like this. And you're like, because this is what I wanted to have, so I could have like uh, a quick color code, so I could see where my uh, um, my things were like which ones, which ones were which, but uh, that's not saved in the assembly presets, so unfortunately that doesn't carry over. So I can't really use that in the way I wanted, and I'm too lazy to do that manually. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I had an email, but I didn't have time to read it in between the bevels. Hmm. All oh, right, because it's inside another one. Okay, there we go. This is one of my favorite things to do with uh, when you have the mesh ops because you can, uh, I can make a cutter, have the live geo and move it around and then when I want to do these kind of things, these kind of shapes that fit with each other, that's like the, my best, one of the best use cases for this because it's so easy to just, like even if I have to move this around, I can just select both of them at the same time and see how the final design will uh, look instantly. So I'm not so much fan of doing this kind of, you know, setup for everything, but for these like uh, specific things, like when you're designing things, 
it's uh, great. It saves me like a lot of time. Jesus, this one is really big. Isn't it? Oh yeah, it's this one. That's why it's so big. Do eh, go inside it. Eh. What? How is it? Oh, no. Doesn't make sense. Oh, a local pieces. Oh. Yeah, the color coding stuff is great. It's uh, it's pretty useful, especially when you're um, sharing scenes, and uh, you need. You know, it's very easy to quickly highlight, for example, where is the low poly model and stuff. Because uh, model scenes tend to be, you know, have quite a lot of items in them, and people, as a rule, do not like organizing things, me included. Okay. Oh, I'm so happy that I finally fixed my uh, rotational script that I had. But I know rotational uh, scaling because I had like a macro that uh, for scaling things, and uh, it never worked. It was really, really weird. And then I figured out that it was just my macro that was uh, wrong. So I finally fixed that the other day, and now I finally have a. Good macro for uh, rescaling things with a scroll wheel, so I don't have to manually use the tool handles like some kind of a barbarian. Uh, I don't know how many scripts I have. I think, I mean, I have 400 plus hotkeys. I don't know, I have like, I have tons of scripts that I don't use, you know, there are Seneca's that I'm just like, I just have them installed because I just batch install all of them. Um, it's super hard to know how many of them I use. I have many hotkeys though. Uh, a lot of them. Let's see how this looks. Let's look at the illumination. But to be fair, like most of what I do, like most of the stuff I do is not related to scripts, it's more macros. And it's not the same thing at all, because macros are super simple. Uh, scripts you actually have to be able to script, you know, you have to, you have to know the scripting language. Uh, I mean, even if it's a simple scripting language, you still have to know it. You need to know the syntax and so on. With the macros, it's just like recording macros in Photoshop, you literally press the record button, you do what you want to do, you stop recording, and you save it as a macro. It's like, it's, uh, there are only s like specific things, like when you do want, want to do specific things that you have to, you know, find out what the commands are, and edit them manually in like a notepad, but uh, that's uh, more often than not, not the case, so. Oh shit, yeah, this is the wrong place. No, 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 not there.
The macros are so easy to make. So, I don't know. I don't count macros as anything complex. It's just... It's just macros, man. Plus, many of the commands and stuff and toggles is actually just one command. And then I just... Uh, instead of instead of putting like a tool uh, manually um, as a command, I'm just... Uh, let's see if this even works. Let's see. Oh, it might look ugly. Or will it? Let's try. Don't kill me. That looks rather alright. Let's see if we can do it. Ha! Worked. I mean, it's taking me 10 years to hotkey that many stuff because it's not like I sat down and went like, now I'm gonna hotkey everything. It's more like you can't just add a hundred hotkeys in like one day and then go like, ooh, I'm super fast because you have to, you have to remember them as well, right? It's muscle memory. So I, uh, I didn't have that many hotkeys a few years ago only, but uh, then I started to uh, basically add hotkeys on purpose uh, just you know take one hour every week where I would go down to like just go th go through uh, lists of scripts just finding things um, making sure I actually took the time to make all those hotkeys so one thing that I do for example is that uh, I actually take uh, everything that I'm annoyed by when I'm live streaming or do some, doing something uh, I would make a note of that in like uh, just this like what it's called this windows what's called the notes wherever they called where they called the sticky notes yeah my presets are just uh, um So I just make sticky notes or everything that I want to fix, and uh, so I don't forget them. And then I took like an hour every week or so, uh, and started uh, integrating those uh, solutions to whatever it was that I, you know, wanted to solve um, to make sure that I didn't forget. And now, I mean, I should be, I should. Still be doing that more, and like more, because there's I have a very, very, very long list of things I want to uh, improve in my own workflow. Um, but I don't always take the time. So I think this, these live streams with these mechs is like first time in quite some time that I actually took the time to uh, properly improve my. Uh, Workflow in quite some time. Yeah. Uh, no, I actually have. Um, so what you can do in Modo is that you uh, you can import a config. So I have all my hotkeys. I actually have a shitload of different config parts. So for example. Um, um, all my um, hotkeys are in one uh, uh, config file, and then I have uh, another config file with, uh, you know, some, some pie menus and stuff. So I build things into like like little, uh, I don't, know, I group them together. For example, my uh, boolean tools, I have uh, a separate config that imports in every time. Uh, so even if I install a new version of Modo, I always have all my hotkeys and everything working. And uh, I have put them on my Dropbox, so 
it's always shared between my computers so if I need to travel and I go with my laptop I still have my most recent updated macros all my everything updated um, so I never need to you know manually set things up and the same thing with the, I can do the mouse uh, hold keys because it's not actually anything assigned to the mouse the only thing that's assigned to the mouse is uh, in the mouse uh, software I have assigned a button to like a key command to each button and I use all the key commands that are uh, rare like you never use like uh, buttons like uh, page up, page down, home and I even use some buttons that Swedish keyboards don't have uh, but uh, Modo has support for so I would never press that button anyway so I don't lose anything on the keyboard and I just assigned uh, my mouse to use those buttons and you can put that on the hardware on the mouse so if you, even if you move the mouse around it still has the same uh, um, same commands uh, I have tutorials that go through most of this stuff I have one that is called how to get uh, faster in Modo which go through how you set up uh, I don't remember exactly everything but it explains how I uh, set things up and um, how to make macros and uh, configs and find menus and how to make tool specific hotkeys and all that stuff uh, I don't know, do I even have a link to that? Um, no, I don't crease my edge to 100%. 100% is full sharp. Um, I normally use 20%. So this is 20%, but you see now it actually looks full hard. It's because for some reason this mesh is set to use... Yes, I know. Uh, subdivision level 3 in uh, or 2 instead of 3. So. I always put 3 as my default. Yeah, there's not that much time left of the streaming today. This one is going to have more dirt and grunge. One of the reasons why the last one didn't have that was because I didn't uh, set it up properly. And then I had already rendered out like a bunch of images. And I was like, ah, uh, fuck. I'm not going to re-render because I was so tired. So this one is going to have a little bit of dirt and grunge.
Well, I mean, that's one of those things, it's like... Why would you do the same thing over and over again? I have no idea. I started saying something and then I stopped. Uh, I almost use uh, Captain Clark exclusively because I mean, sub D can be cheaper in amount of polygons, but uh, I always want to have the option of making uh, proper creasing. And uh, if I only use one, that cuts down on any potential confusion. I have a playlist. Wait, I should probably put it in this description. Uh, there we go. There's the playlist. Signal, signal again. It's one of those really <laughs> awesome but annoying features in Moto that you can scrub where you want it to render faster. Which is great, but it also means that you're just sitting there scrubbing. Oh, now I know what I missed. Uh, and also... Signal, signal! Yeah, I had to delete like uh, 20 songs from my playlist. Yeah, I love Hawken, so that's no uh, that's no uh, strange coincidence. I actually made a couple of mechs for them, which was really fun. I mean, I, I love that style. It's like, it's the best. It was like, that was a fantastic style that game had. It had so much awesome art direction, and so much awesome concept art. It's just too bad they didn't make it into like a single player game. I wish it was like a single player mech game, that would be awesome.
yeah it's uh, just or it's not just a moto file it's a assembly preset so it's just a preset file you drag in from the preset browser but you have to create it in a special way you have to create it via the uh, uh, setup um, place where it's called what is it even called hold on uh, yeah the setup because they're in the uh, assembly window you know you have to set it up there but once you do that set it up an assembly preset properly it works and you can do a lot lots of cool shit with that I'll probably do mo lots of stuff that I haven't thought about because that's the whole you know black box thing that I haven't really you know I don't understand I just wanted to make some presets Yeah, I know it's. Uh, I think the, the the chat is saved in the uh, in the um, clips on Twitch, I think, but not when you export it to YouTube. I guess I would have to do this thing where you actually have uh, an overlay in the stream. But that takes up screen estate. I don't know if you guys would want that, but I could do that. Should probably do that. This is a thing imaging I built. It's, a, it's got stuff on it. <laughs> I mean, ten million polygons is nothing. To be honest, I mean, I think I think my computer can handle at least a hundred million. Uh, it's the amount of editable editable geo per layer, and what kind of um, commands you're using that uh, really sets uh, the limit for uh, the performance model. So it's not really the amount of polygons rendered in the viewport because then you, have, you can go really fucking high before that becomes a problem uh, it's uh, 64 gigs of RAM which I never get to use because nothing uses that much RAM uh, 1080 GTX and uh, uh, i7 uh, i7 6700 K quad core 4 gigahertz processor I think so what I've done is that I basically what you can do is okay I'm just gonna show everyone Okay, so what you can do is that you can have all the cutters. I have them in a group. Like, you know, they are in a, in a group. Like, here's a group called cutters. And then I basically have a material that says, use this group. Everything in this group is going to have this material. And it's a transparent material in this 
And you also have a base shader here so that it actually doesn't render when you're rendering the image. So when you render it out, all of this will be, even if it's visible like this, it will be invisible in the render. So there you go. That's how we do it. I think, the, I mean, 16 gigs of RAM and, uh, just let's see. Yeah, so I'm using 32 gigs now, but yeah, that's mostly, yeah, Modo's only using 3 gigs, so you could have 8 gigs of RAM and still do this, and uh, let's see, and I have, yeah, almost 200 FPS, so uh, with a uh, 1070 and 16 gigs of RAM, you should be able to do this no problem with like 150 FPS. I mean, I upgraded from like a 970 to uh, to a 1080, and uh, I didn't notice the difference in modo. Like, I couldn't tell because. This is not really an expensive uh, model. It's uh, not really that bad. Yeah, but every, every, almost everything I do with Modo is actually quite kind of lightweight. Like my renders are pretty lightweight. It's only you know, there's one model, almost uh, no um, nothing complicated in the. Uh, all right, wrong. Have to no. Uh, I can't really. I mean, I can't really make them much simpler, my motor scenes, like, the renders for this one, I don't even have a light source in the scene. It's like literally not a single light source. It's only using an HDR image, it doesn't get much cheaper than that. Um, I also turn down things like the settings for the, uh, it's called, uh, the reflection bounce, Modo's default reflection bounce is 8 reflection bounces. I always turn that down into uh, uh, 2, because unless you're actually doing something where something needs to reflect back and forth several bounces, like you're not going to be able to tell. You need like mirror surfaces for the difference to be there. And that saves a lot of performance when you're doing things like metals and so on. Or like any physical based rendering with blurred reflections, which is the new mode of default since Model Rule 9.
Um, if I export the geometry, yes, but I wouldn't export that geometry because the actual uh, cut up boolean geometry also exists as a layer. So I just have like, if I want to export like uh, the actual uh, boolean mesh, I just have a command. It's just like, it's just a simple command that does that. It just freezes the mesh and copies it to a new layer. So you can just fire that command once and you will have it in a new layer. I think you can just right click on any freeze mesh operations, duplicate and freeze. Simple as that. Um, depends. To be honest, like, if I would texture this properly, like, for a game, I probably wouldn't use any of the modo stuff. But, you know, doing, like, previs and just for portfolio purposes, I would use, uh... Um, then I would add the procedural textures and so on. I do do that quite a lot in my models. Um, for presentation purposes. If I would do that for real, I probably like, you know, when I texture them for real, I get rid of the procedural textures. Or I just bake them out separately as a mask, not baked into the texture. So I use those as a mask. Sometimes I use the uh, uh, generate like some um, procedural uh, and I mean inclusion based uh, rust masks, for example. This one really needs a.
pretty fun to model with live booleans. It's like inverted modeling. I wonder if I can just make this one really big. So, it used to be unstable, uh, but now it's actually really stable. So, in Auto 11 I haven't had a single crash from uh, the actual booleans. So that is very nice. Before it was a bit more sensitive. first introduced in Modo 10 it was still a bit unreliable, now it's uh, been very stable actually. clean up of this there's so many young players who think they're in the wrong place
Let's go here. Organizing things a bit. Okay, it looks like everything. Yeah, there. The thing is that I also have a hotkey for uh, you know delete uh, empty layers. Problem is that uh, when I'm doing so many meshops and I have some empty meshop layers, I just don't want to delete the meshop layers and ruin the meshop chain in those. Uh, so that's why I'm being a bit careful and not just um, doing just like a quick remove of everything. It's only because of that. Aha! I spotted some more. organize my UVs very well. I'm the wrong person to ask because they are a mess. I don't really care about how they are how they work together. Okay. Um I'm just gonna Let this one sit for a minute.
back in action. <sighs> it's okay. Seems like it's missing something. I think a lot of it will also be fixed with the colors and so on. The knee pads are definitely... I mean, I'm not going to say too clean because you need some clean surfaces. But they're actually... Uh, there's a few spots I want to hit. I'm not happy with. And I'm gonna create a new material. Okay, wait, this one is. I have to go to the original one. This is easy. Uh, okay. You guys. <laughs> Good enough. And I'm gonna delete this one because I don't need it anymore. Delete these guys. Those guys. Group and uh, uh, constant. No. Oh, Jesus. There you go. I normally have like a pre-made setup for this. But have to do. I don't think there are any good articles, but it's pretty simple. It's extremely simple to understand. Okay, so this one. Okay, this is not gonna work. Or is it?
Yeah, I just did. So that's the what I'm gonna do for my decal uh, tools later as well. Just make that, make a bunch of macros and pie menus and shit for that. Floaters on floaters. Panel lines. That is true. It's very simple when you're using the uh, rounded cheddar. Just do this. Ew! Now we have a panel line. So I split it and cap the edges, and when you look at it in the render, see if we can find it. There, panel lines. Bam, done. That was a very good point. I should uh, add some panel lines. But it doesn't play very well with... Um, the booleans. Because... They are like on the exact same position. If we do this... Does it work? Or does it just... Yeah, I think it might not work. Yeah, too bad. I have to do it properly then. <laughs> properly. Then you can always do this. Yeah, that's what I did, uh, or like, uh, I realized that, you know, I couldn't have that, but then if you cut with gap offset, it still doesn't work with the boolean uh, in one layer, I would have to use another uh, kind of boolean, and then I would have to redo the whole thing, and uh, I didn't want to.
Okay, I'm almost at eight hours. Yeah, I use that a lot, actually. I mean, first of all, the face with the normals uh, use on everything, no matter what, because it just produces better normals. I started using it at machine games on Wolfenstein Old Blood, for example. We used it on like everything, uh, just because you get cleaner normal maps and better compression. But the specific method where they use tiling textures and uh, face with the normals and the decals. I mean, what makes them unique is not the face with the normals and stuff, it's that they're relying so much on uh, decals. And I have been working with that on some things, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, it only works really well for certain art styles, other art styles it's just, uh, it's not really a good fit. For their art style it's amazing. So that's like a really cool thing that they've done, to speed up their... Uh, Asset creation. I mean, it wouldn't be possible to make that volume of assets with that high, you know, texture quality if you didn't do it like that. We just put too much. Yes, I have a portfolio. So the other model I made yesterday, I uh, felt, you know, I dropped the ball a little bit on the materials and uh, rendering. I'm not sure if I'm going to render this one out today because I'm going to probably be social instead. Um, but I might get a render out or two, let's see, it depends, depends on if I 
basically managed, depends on if I managed to make a great render <laughs> the first try or not. So I don't know. I don't have time to sit around with it. Yeah, sure. Post ahead. It's coming up on YouTube. There are still some areas that I'm not happy with. I think I'm gonna have to live with that for now. It's a speed model after all. Relatively, at least. Okay. Hmm. So I'm just gonna go with maybe five ten more minutes and that had to be enough today I think so it's gonna real quick do some
just add some uh, bullshit decals. Actually, I have an idea how I'm gonna try for rendering out the decals. I really need to try that. Yeah, the macro is very simple. It's just a push polygon, like a micrometer. So, it's just that. It's just like, yeah, turn on the push tool, push it out, then turn it off.
Okay. That's it. All right. I think I'm done for today now. I'm gonna post this up on YouTube. Everything. Okay, well, thanks for watching today.